Yeah, so my, uh, my name is Dave Mintern. I'm going to do the first part of this talk. And my colleague here, Neil Vasudevan, is going to do the second part. Uh, my background is, is actually the group I work in is more the, in the uh, storage group, like the non-volatile group, or, or Neil's uh, working in the networking group. And we definitely do a lot of talking over the last uh, you know, four or five years on, you know, when it gets to uh, storage and networking. So today we're going to talk about uh, NVMover Fabric, Ethernet transports, and, and the, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, you know, what we have is a couple different varieties of, of Ethernet transport, so we're, we'll cover that. So before I start, I wanted to, this is my one slide, I want to just sort of talk about the evolution of how we got to where we're at now. Uh, so, you know, when we started NVMe, originally it was, it was to standardize a, a, an interface on a, uh, a PCI Express fabric to get that because the PCI Express fabric was needed based on the media characteristics that were coming out, both low latency and or high bandwidth. So the focus of NVMe initially was you know, purely PCIe. We brought in this concept of fabrics you know, into that group of, of PCIe folks, you know, which was sort of interesting. But so the first version of, of, of 1.0 of fabrics, what was chosen was RDMA as, because it was complementary as far as its characteristics of performance, latency. It was, you know, it was sort of a good match to bring in. You know, at the same time, the fiber channel folks you know, uh, defined the FC NVMe. You know, they, they saw the, uh, the same thing, you know, having end -end NVMe uh, operations very important, especially as the NVMe functionality is evolving, you know, the common NVMe functionality. More recently, last year, we, we brought in uh, NVMe TCP definition of that. And at the same time, what you're seeing in the, in the base NVMe is, you know, one of the important aspects of it was this, the concept of, of latency determinism uh, is in the 1.4. So really what, you, what you're seeing here is, you know, sort of a combination of, you know, in, in the marketplace, low latency, NVM, deterministic latency, you know, new fabrics scale out, you know, and how, how do all these things play together, you know, and, and I think it's going to get even more interesting as we move to like Gen 5 PCIe, whereas the NVMe endpoint, that piece of it, you know, that last little hop across that transport is, is you know, is pretty much, you know, speed of lightning to, to the folks that talk about it. They don't talk much about, you know, QoS on the, that PCIe transport. When we move into networks, you know, that's going to be a very important aspect of it is, you know, how do I, how does this network work as far as its quality of service, its, you know, its bandwidth and its scaling and such. So it's a little, you know, so the, so the network transport folks have more to worry about than the, you know, the folks on PCIe as far as, you know, at least the transport aspect of it. So one of the, one of the things with the NVMe storage on Ethernet, what you're seeing, which the previous, uh, uh, speaker mentioned as well as sort of this disaggregated model. You know, there's also a, a sort of a hyperconverged model, but I think the more common one right now is, is disaggregation and there's various forms of it. What you see is, is you know, solutions in, in uh, like rack level solutions, things like a, ephemeral storage, you know, where in, in a cloud they want to just have a compute, a set of compute in the rack and then essentially move the, uh, the local attached storage away from the compute over across, uh, you know, to like a JBOF or, or something like that. That same model you see also see in storage systems where, you know, where they want to have like the storage front end nodes, the compute part of that be scalable independent of the drive shelves and, and hence they, they tend to use a, a disaggregated at the rack level or maybe, you know, across a rack to, uh, you know, build out these uh, storage systems. When we introduce TCP, you know, what you're seeing now is, okay, now TCP has a wider scope. You know, you're seeing potentially, you know, that being used to do uh, more scale out. So, a, you know, there's a couple of vendors, you know, doing uh, front end between the compute and the storage uh, nodes as being NVMe TCP and, and using that, you know, in, in a more of a data center wide model. And then also, you know, we have activities coming along with you know, things like, you know, Ethernet connected drives, all, you know, so we have a lot of, a lot of things where, where the storage and the computer are going to be separated from part in, in various uh, topologies. And the question comes up, okay, you know, what is the Ethernet 
technology, you know, what is the transport, what transport you use for, to do what, and you know, which one's more effective at, at it. So what we have to choose from, you know, in, in the blue, you know, if you look at what we have around 1.1, under RDMA, you have a couple different varieties of, of, of RDMAs. Uh, the ones that are standard are iWarp and Rocky. Uh, I, wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if uh, another one comes out sometime based on some of the work being done in HPC in the cloud and stuff. You know, I'm hearing rumblings that you know, there may be some other type of RDMA, but for now, these are the two that we use, which are the reliable connected support. Also, NVMe TCP. Uh, uh, is used as well. And then the other uh, transports are uh, a fiber channel. And then under RDMA, what you see is the non-Ethernet RDMA providers were in, uh, of InfiniBand and uh, OmniPath. So if you look at this from a layered point of view, <clears throat> what you have is you have an NVMe layer on top. And this is where, if you look at what's happening like in, this, in the base specification, of NVMe, this is where all the definition happens, you know, as far as, you know, what a namespace is, you know, what a controller is, you know, all that is evolving constantly through the revisions of the specifications, and the, and the drives are taking this in, and then also what you see is like target endpoint systems are pulling functionality out of this base level of NVMe layer. And this is really, you know, what you see is this is really the NVMe queues, NVMe command completion. This is common across all the transports. If you drop down into the uh, Ethernet transports, this is where we get a little bit of separation between the NVMe RDMA and the NVMe TCP. And uh, what you see exchanged here is, is there are, which is common for all the fabrics, is, is uh, a capsules. So there is this encapsulation of the NVMe commands and completions. And depending on what type of transport it is, you'll see you know, different forms of data transfer. I think uh, Peter yesterday showed the, you know, the taxonomy of our uh, uh, transports where, where, for instance, RDMA is more like a, a memory operations read. You RDMA reads and writes of the, of the data exchanges. If you look at TCP, it's more of a, you know, because TCP natively doesn't have anything for, you know, right around memory. It's really just a byte stream, you know, so what you do is you formulate uh, a PDU, you know, sort of a, a, a packet formation in that byte stream, and, and that is how you do your data exchange uh, in that model. Dropping down, that middle layer is really more of a implementation, you know, because, you know, depending on the implementation, there'll be different pieces there, but from a software implementation, the way the RDMA get to the, to the RDMA providers is through the verbs. So basically what that means is that's a common uh, layer of NVMe RDMA depending on, you know, no matter what transport you have, whether it's iWarp or Rocky or InfiniBand, you know, it's basically the same at that level and it's down into the verbs where it divides up into, you know, both provider type, but then also, you know, an individual uh, RDMA provider will provide a driver, you know, that's, that's sort of the bottom half of these verbs. And then as it drops into the, into the hardware layer, you, you drop into the network, you know, the standardization of the network, you know, both, you know, on the wire is standard. The implementation, of course, you know, of, of the NICs, you know, is, is implementation specific. So if you look at uh, a TCP, same thing, it drops down through a sockets layer, which is common for all the different TCP applications. You know, basically NVMe over fabric, NVMe TCP is just another application within, you know, within a kernel that's using TCP sockets. That drops straight down, you know, into the, uh, you know, through IP, through TCP, you know, and, and uh, down to Ethernet. I show, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that one of the RDMAs, you know, the Rocky V2 is over lossless Ethernet, where the iWarp, you know, because it's based on TCP, is, is very similar to the uh, NVMe TCP protocol that it uses, you know, just the TCP uh, transport itself. So looking at specifically at, at the RDMA aspects to start with, what you see is what was implemented in Linux and standardized in NVMe, you know, was an NVMe RDMA transport. This was implemented, it was implemented over a common set of verbs in Linux. Uh, the two, two common providers are Rocky and iWarp. Uh, the exchange of these capsules, the encapsulated uh, NVMe operations were done with RDMA send. So essentially when you 
you know, send an enemy command over to the other side, it's encapsulated in an RDMA send. When you give the completion back, it comes back in a send and it uses the RDMA Q pair mappings. Uh, the uh, data exchange is always done through RDMA read or write, except for, you know, we have a, one case where you do an immediate write where, where the data actually comes, you know, encapsulated with the send for, for a low latency write. Full hardware offload of the RDMA operations, and, and I think, you know, there have been software versions of this, but, you know, not viable, you know, to run any kind of a software, but basically a software implementation of a hardware offload is not typically a good idea to use. So really the ones you're looking for is a, is a full hardware offload. Uh, they do the data, direct data placement on the ingress of the NVMe command data. So, you know, there is, in, in both these cases, in both the, you know, the transmission and, and input, it places the data directly into the buffer, you know, that the, uh, the, either the host or the target needs. The Q pairs are mapped one to one with the RDMA Q pairs. That was just, you know, the best way to do it to avoid, you know, head line blocking across the uh, NVMe Q pairs. One thing about these is, as you're doing an RDMA deployment, you know, both sides have to be enabled. You know, so basically the host and the target endpoints need to be enabled with the same provider type. They don't have to be the same, like manufacturer. For instance, if you have a Rocky from manufacturer A and a Rocky from manufacturer B. Those will interoperate, you know, at the Rocky level, but they have to be the same. You know, they can't like mix an iWarp with a Rocky or something like that. You know, so they have to be both of the same provider type. Looking at uh, the the differences between those provider types, you know, on, on the left I'm showing the Rocky V2, and this is this is uh, the definition of essentially InfiniBand over Ethernet is, is where the Rocky came from. With the V2 version incorporated a UDP encapsulation, uh, and what that requires is uh, it over uh, lossless Ethernet. You know, which I wouldn't say you could you could actually run it over lossy Ethernet, but for efficient use of it, lossless Ethernet is is required. And here, what you have is the congestion control. You know, through the DCB, PFC, and and QCN, and, and there's you know there's a, a bunch of varieties of these. You know, like DCCQN. You know, depending on on what your uh, sort of the scope of your deployment, but definitely, uh, you know, for the basic uh, functionality, you need what I what I have listed here. Well, there's quite a bit of literature out in the world, and actually, even like rec as recently as like a couple months ago at SIGCOM, where I think the cloud vendors are the ones sort of pushing the use of RDMA and whether they're pushing it for storage or whether they're pushing it for HPC in the cloud, what you see happening in the Rocky V2 is there's conditions as you grow this network up where you actually, everyone is, seems to be doing a custom solution around how they deal with the congestion control. So it's basically, it's really not a solved problem for the, you know, for the general big deployments. It may be okay for the smaller deployments, you know, like a back end storage, you know, where you can engineer it. But as you grow up, you know, into bigger deployments, there's, there's definitely, you know, still research happening and, and work happening to, you know, get the, the latency, deterministic latency behavior and bandwidth performance across these networks. You know, so it's, so it's, it's been ongoing for quite a bit of time. Uh, if you look at, on the other choice is, is iWarp. You know, iWarp's been around the, in definition for a while and there's been various implementation. What this does is uses TCP as, as the uh, reliable transport. The TCP, of course, is implemented in the RNIC itself, so it's not the same TCP implementation that's up in the host. Uh, this can benefit from the lossless Ethernet. You know, so for instance, some of the ECN, you know, it can get benefits from that, but it doesn't require it for, for efficient use. If this is not as widely deployed as Rocky-based solutions, I think just because of the uh, you know, the availability of, of the components at the speeds that, uh, that folks are pushing at. The choice of the, you know, which one you use here is really sort of based on, you know, what network infrastructure you have, you know, what your dependencies are. And then also, you know, you may find that certain RNIC vendors offer one or both or, you know, like the variations. So you can actually, you know, select uh, which one you use based, you know, not based on the product, but based on, you know, sort of, you know, what your network dependency is. 
So looking at the uh, NVMe over TCP Ethernet transport, this, this is relatively new. You know, the implementation's only been in, I think, the kernel for about a year. And really what, the reason we did this, you know, the motivation behind this was to enable NVMe over fabric on existing uh, data center networks. You know, one of the things when we had previously, we had like iSCSI, for instance, you know, that would, that would attach to a target that had NVMe drives. What was happening with those type of models, you were losing the NVMe end-to-end -end, uh, uh, functionality. So what we needed was something that would enable us to uh, <coughs> have NVMe hosts you know, do end-to-end -end operations across any network you know, with a, uh, an NVMe target with NVMe drive. So that was really one of the big motivations for it. We wanted this to be more efficient than iSCSI. I mean, that was like, we already saw that on our local drive transports, you know, that we said, okay, you know, on a local drive, local SCSI drive versus a local NVMe drive, we wanted that efficiency. And, and that was, uh, and, and especially for, for targets that had the uh, NVMe SSDs back ends. I have heard of some folks that actually are using NVMe over fabrics with hard drives, you know, but that's, that's, you know, and getting good results with that too, but that really, it was really for this end-to-end uh, -end NVMe part of it. It facilitates both software, you know, which I show here, and a hardware-based implementation. I know there are a couple vendors that, that I think it was mentioned in the previous talk, you know, should we have uh, NVMe TCP hardware implementations? I mean, there's, you know, I think if, you know, if, if that's the requirement of, of a certain deployment, it makes perfect sense, but, you know, and so, what you see is sort of a combination of, of you know, of, of software with some form of, of offloads, but then also, you know, a full hardware offload. One of the things we did with the NVMe uh, TCP is, uh, you know, make sure that the, that the NVMe uh, queues were aligned with TCP connections, and really this sort of comes into play when, we're, when we want to have uh, separation of traffic you know, on those queues, you know, and enables for uh, connection-based uh, separation to uh, CP core association, which is, that's sort of a fundamental functionality in NVMe on the host side is not to have, you know, cores competing with each other on the queues, you know, so, so that's what helps enable it. So uh, what we wanted to do, do is, is just get sort of a, uh, you know, a, a simple comparison of performance and what we did for this test, you know, which, which is sort of like we hadn't done this before, was we took, you know, a, a host and a target, you know, Linux target. This is just, you know, straight off the, off the uh, shelf Linux uh, host and target. And we wanted to run these transports on a multi-transport capable NIC. So essentially the same NIC running, you know, running the Rocky, running the uh, iWarp, and then also running the TCP and, and sort of see what, what that looks like. And so what, what we have here is you know, sort of the basic, you know, IOPS and latency. <clears throat> and you're, you see that the two RDMAs, you know, roughly are equivalent with each other as far as its IOPS and their latencies. And then the TCP portion of it, uh, we're, we're lagging a bit on the IOPS, and that, that has to do with more of the, you know, we used a constant Q depth for that. And as, because of the latency incurred with the TCP, you know, so like if we increase the Q depth, we were actually went up in the IOPS, not as high as where the RDMAs were, but you know, it was sort of reflective of you know what you would see with with the sort of the you know the current generation of the of the TCP implementation, uh, and then also we look at latency, you know, where uh, the TCP latency was roughly you know, in, in the 40-ish uh, microseconds because of the, uh, uh, you know, it's because of things that Anil will explain later <laughs> in this section. So this is sort of where we're at. So what I wanted to do was, okay, how do we improve that? You know, what's, what's our step to improving that on the Linux uh, NVMe TCP performance, you know, in software? You know, how do we go about doing that? Thank you, Dave. Um, so like uh, Dave showed you uh, data from, um, from the three NVMe uh, transports, iWarp, uh, Rocky, and TCP. And as you saw, TCP lagged iWarp and, um, and Rocky. So the question 
uh, is, you know, really can TCP do better? Are there uh, inherent inefficiencies in TCP uh, today that are that's preventing it from, you know, potentially realizing um, better performance? Um, and <clears throat> the answer to that is is yes, um, but this is not necessarily um, an NVMe or TCP problem. It's a generic sockets uh, problem that there is inefficiencies um, in traditional socket-based uh, TCP programming, and this <clears throat> and the and the table here lists some of these inefficiencies. So in the and like I said before, these are you know general inefficiencies, uh, but specifically when we talk about it in the context of NVMe or TCP. Um, things like you know interrupts um, are problems because um, you don't have a really good way of preventing an interrupt from firing uh, when, like for instance, an enemy stack is doing useful work. So it's in the while, for instance, uh, let's say that, that a response is being generated and an interrupt fires at that time from the device, uh, the interrupt gets priority and so the response gets delayed. Um, also. Important um, to performance is you know how many context switches you're seeing, and things like synchronization. Uh, both of these uh, come as a result of sharing that typically occurs um, in in the standard networking stack. Um, it's also important to uh, to ensure that you know for uh, working set locality for protocol processing and the application and the NVMe stack to all uh, run in the same context. And that's one of the challenges that exists in, in the current NVMe stack. Um, so like I said, mentioned before, these are sort of generic challenges that exist for any socket-based application. Um, and earlier this year, uh, Intel announced a technology called um, application device queues. Um, which is a workload optimization technology aimed at um, uh, packet steering and queuing. And <clears throat> ADQs actually address some of these inefficiencies and that results in you know, a boost in performance. So before we uh, dive into you know, how it boosts NVMe over TCP performance, um, I'd like to just go over briefly uh, what ADQ is. Um, at its core, ADQ is a uh, sort of queuing and steering technology. It's built on um, existing history of queuing and steering, but with a slight twist um, by bringing the application into the picture and making it, you know, the forefront, making um, putting it right in in front of queuing and steering and making it responsible for triggering those things. So. As you can see from the graphic on the left, um, ADQs provide dedicated and isolated queues. And also what they do is you can create these express lanes from application threads of execution to these hardware queues. In addition, what you can do is <clears throat> for egress bandwidth in an application specific manner, you can control it. Um, this is useful if you want to prioritize bandwidth amongst applications and or want to divide bandwidth amongst applications um, at an application-specific um, level. Now, all of this is done <clears throat> within the framework of the standard Linux networking stack to which uh, Intel has contributed significant uh, patches that have already been upstreamed um, and ADQ leverages um, these patches. The particular ones are shown in the table on the right under, under, under kernel. And also, uh, from an application point of view, you want to make um, a small change to, to, to create this, a single producer consumer model between an application thread of execution and these queues. And once you have done these, you, know, you, you, you really see how some of the issues that I referred to earlier, uh, get addressed. Um, applications are where the action is. Applications best know their needs. And um, one of the core principles of ADQ is to let the application decide or have a, have a bigger say 
in queuing and steering and, and, and packet processing that is done on its behalf. Right? Um, so, so with that in mind, um, let's take a look at what sort of changes we and enhancements we made to the current open source NVMe over uh, TCP stack. Um, and I'd also like to uh, you know, let you guys know that uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, we actually released some of these patches, especially on the NVMe target side, out to the NVMe uh, uh, mailing list. And we'll soon be releasing the changes that we've also made to the, to the host side. Our goal here is to make it um, open, and we actually invite uh, comments and contributions um, uh, towards those optimizations. So specifically, in terms of um, the initiator, what we needed to do is, like I said before, you want to reduce the number of context switches. And one of the things that we had to do to the initiator uh, stack was to uh, do in-context submission. So in other words, when an application, in this case, you know, your, your benchmark like FIO is submitting requests, uh, we want to submit those requests in the context of FIO and, and get out in the context of FIO, as opposed to, they used to there is actually in the current code, there is um, a context which is there, that occurs from FIO for submission, and then the submission is done in a different context. Um, <clears throat> This leverages ADQs really well. Um, and the second uh, important change that we made was to, in, in the data that you're about to see, we had enhanced it with busy pulling optimizations. Uh, what we are planning to release uh, soon is we are leveraging and looking to leverage some of the recent developments in polling, um, like IOU ring, and um, AIO, AIO poll um, initiatives, and we're trying to look at that as, as, as the plumbing to, to kickstart busy polling. Um, busy polling sockets and, um, and e-poll-based busy polling um, is something that is native to the networking stack, um, and Intel had pushed these um, into the native networking stack. So since NVMe or TCP, you know, as an entity runs over the standard networking stack, we want to stitch these existing capabilities that have already been upstream with the networking stack and plummet um, along with um, the storage stack, and in particular, in this case, NVMe over TCP. That's, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. And uh, the last piece that uh, we also added was uh, to set socket priority, and what uh, setting socket priority does uh, from a networking point of view um, is that <clears throat> it allows you to use uh, symmetric queuing. And symmetric queuing is a mechanism wherein an application thread um, is, an application thread's ingress and egress traffic go through the same TXRX queue pair. And that's a mechanism that's, that's already, like I said, upstreamed in the kernel. And what we are doing is enhancing the NVMe over TCP stack to, to sort of use that capability. Right, so these are the changes that we had made uh, to the initiator. Um, and in a similar vein, um, the changes to the target are also, as you would expect, similar, because one of the key things here is, you know, you want to reduce interrupts, you want to reduce context switches and sharing. Um, and the way to, one of the methods to do that is to, you know, create the separation which ADQs provide at a hardware level and also push that separation all the way up, um, up the stack all the way to the application. So in, this, in the case of the target, similar kind of enhancements. We had made busy polling enhancements, which is the main busy polling uh, or the main target loop that exists, um, has a non-blocking receive and send uh, loop. So in that loop, we had added a time-based mechanism that, in, that allowed polling to continue, especially if there was nothing available. So let's say that you know, you, 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 you're looking for requests, there were no requests, and you're looking for completions, and there were no completions. You continue to look for them as opposed to go away and, and let an interrupt pick you up. Um, so that's the enhancement that we added. Um, and similar to the initiator, we also added this enhancement for setting the priority, uh, the socket priority on the connection. 
and that, that allows you to use symmetric use. Now these patches, if you've been following the reflector, you know, went live on, on Tuesday. Um, and like I said, we'd like, you all guys, we'd like you guys to weigh in and provide feedback and help, uh, help you know, in general the community to improve the performance of the NVMe or TCP stack um, with, um, with ADQ. So, so once we did all this, what did the performance look like? <clears throat> right, this is what we're seeing now. Um, so you can see that the gap between um, NVMe over um, fabric with, um, with iWarp and Rocky and comparing it with NVMe over TCP when it's accelerated with ADQs, the gap narrows, right? Um, you can see that you know, the IOPS are roughly the same. Um, the latencies also come down. Uh, in this case, you know, for NVMe over TCP, you're actually seeing a latency of you know, roughly 25 microseconds, which is actually um, very good. Um, <clears throat> so what this goes to show is that you know, when you're able to create um, and, and accelerate uh, NVMe over TCP with ADQs, um, that you get a pretty significant um, boost in performance. There's more to be done here, um, but you know, this gives you confidence that you know, there's lots of other optimizations that are in play and, and can be applied um, to NVMe over, over TCP. Um, so the question here is, okay, you, we did this work, and in particular, you know, how, did, how, did, how specifically did we address these inefficiencies? So if you look at um, the first three, um, most of the inefficiencies there uh, were addressed because we introduced event-based busy polling, um, and we also created the, the socket priority that, that in effect created symmetric queuing. Um, so the combination of those two created the isolation that you need between the application thread in this case, you know, FIO and the ADQs, the specific ADQs. Um, in addition, like I said, to uh, improve uh, working set locality, um, we ensure that through event-based busy polling, you're, you're letting the application trigger the protocol processing um, because that's an important property that you can get uh, when you're able to isolate queues specifically for an application, then you can put the onus back on the application to be able to, to, drain, uh, to drain queues. When queues are shared, um, that is not something you can do, uh, which is when you know, the kernel gets involved to help sort that out. But if you're able to isolate queues uh, for the specific application, then you can push that back on the application. And in fact, when you do that, you get an additional benefit in that um, the application's behavior is also truly reflected in the wire behavior. Um, in, 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 the, in the other case, what ends up happening is that when you have the kernel proxying for you, uh, the wire behavior may be slightly different um, than what you get um, um, when the application is directly doing, doing the draining. So, so, so that's what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, and now I'll invite Dave back on stage to give you a summary of, um, looks like we have a question, so that's fine, I can take the question now. So this is great, and I'm sure if you're dedicated to say, hey, I want you to do everything perfectly for this one application with this one set of hardware, what does it do to everything else in your system? Is there any other impact to the network while you're doing it? Um, so this is a good question, right? So, so what, what we do is, I mean, you can, um, you, you, you pro what you're effectively saying is you want to prioritize certain applications on that particular um, server. Um, so that's yours to pick, which are the ones that you want to prioritize. So when you prioritize some and you, you leave, it's, this is not to say that other applications are not going to run. They are not going to get dedicated queues for themselves. The other applications, you may, you may choose to say, to create an environment like, okay, I have like these three applications that are super critical, I want to give them dedicated queues, and the rest of them use shared queues, right? So, so that's how it'll, it'll, it'll um, sort of uh, uh, pan out. 
Um, so the ones that have dedicated queues can use some of these optimizations. The ones that don't have dedicated queues will fall back to whatever uh, the standard mechanism is, which means that you know, the, the kernel gets involved and, and busy polling and our polling mechanisms are not uh, fully realized, or the benefits of polling are not fully realized in that context because the queues are shared. So starvation is still a threat? Um, it's, it's not from that point of view. I mean, the, the, the way the polling would work is, only, is, is that when there is traffic for that application, that's when it gets prioritized. So when you, when you think of a system where there's traffic going on more traffic going on for that particular application than any other, at that point, this kicks in and starts, starts using the resources on, on, on the platform um, and, and does continue to use them um, because it is expecting, uh, it is being prioritized. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So that's all going to be that's all proper network topology. Right. right. So that's that's yeah. That's that. Be, this is, doesn't impact that at all. Right. Meaning, this, would be within a particular this is within a particular platform. How do you create? I mean, this is sort of the last mile problem, right? I mean, that is that's been talked about quite a bit. In that, you know, traditional networking. You think of networking, you you kind of get it to the end point at the nick at the end point and say, okay, we have networking is done. But there's, there's still more networking to be done till, and you're not, the work is not complete till you actually get it to the ultimate consumer, which is the application thread that is actually going to do something with the, with the data that comes through. So this set of optimizations is aimed at, at the host side. When, you, when you've gotten the packet already inside the NIC, how do you most efficiently deliver it uh, to an application for a standard socket application like TCP? Sorry. So that yeah, so so it's a very good question, and it is it is a standard question that is uh, that is asked, right? I mean, and and when you're looking at you know most of the high performing sort of uh, initiatives um, out there to get the lowest latency and to to keep lower context, which is polling, is the is the is the choice. What we do here, though, is that we're not polling indefinitely. We, we, we polling starts when packets for this particular application start coming in, and if there are no packets for the application for, for you know your poll timeout that you can set to whatever that's configurable, then it goes back and then kicks itself back in through interrupts and then goes back to polling. So, so that's the mechanism here. Um, but in general, um, you know, if you look at any of the high performance mechanisms, they're all polling mechanisms. Have you quantified the performance? Uh, have you quantified the additional CPU cost of ADQ? The additional CPU cost of ADQ uh, relative to uh, TCP, or I mean, which which one? Yeah, yeah. So, so for so when you so so the thing here is what ends up happening is that when you're pushing. Let's say in this case, right? You want to get to uh, um, for wire rate at 100 gig at 4K. You are looking at roughly 2.7 million IOPS. Um, so at that point, where you're pushing it hard, the number of cores that you might need with busy polling, because of the efficiencies that you gain as a consequence, maybe is, is roughly on par or less than what you would otherwise need, um, because in the other case. Where you're spending the cycles is there are lots of interrupts occurring, there's lots of context switches occurring, so it's a trade-off between how much you gain through polling versus how much you lose because of the inefficiencies. And normally, the polling, you know, in that calculation, polling does better. And last question from me: uh, Have you guys published like the changes? You, I'm sure you made changes to FIO. Yeah. We will make that public. The, the initiator side, we haven't uh, made it public yet. The target side, we just put it out, just, uh, like I said, on Tuesday. Our goal is to get the initiators out. The reason why, it's not like some big thing. The main reason why we haven't made it public is we would really like to 
uh, enable the IOU ring and the AIO poll and, and then you know, put it out there after we do that. We, we are just slightly behind in our schedule. No, I think, what did she, what, you showed 10 minutes or five minutes? 10, okay, we have time. Okay. So the, the ADQ standard seems to contemplate a single tenant of her multiple applications. But in an example, a real world example we have, we have two intelligence agencies sharing one processor. And we have a technique that allows that to happen. And we brokered an agreement at the super admin level to provide consensus super admin. But below that, we have total multi-tenancy. Could the ADQ standard be used such that an application alignment with a Q pair, with a, with a Q, could create secure multi-tenancy? That's my question. Uh, so you could isolate. I mean, basically, you know, what you do in this case is, um, in order to secure multi-tenancy, um, one way to think of it is. You have separate signatures for your different tenants or your different applications as if, or your different containers, whatever they are, right? And those will ensure that the queues that are being used for those specific applications or tenants or containers will contain traffic only for, for them and nothing else, right? And that is a core principle because without that, you can't push the onus of draining back to the application or not, right? That, that's very important for us to do that, and that's one of the fundamental principles of ADQ. It seems enabling. Sorry? It seems enabling. The, 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 the ADQ seem to be enabled, and enabling are better secure. Yeah, yeah, because you can isolate. Yeah. Did you see same behavior for the right? Did you see same? Did you see the same behavior? Roughly, yeah. roughly. We didn't, um, uh, we, we characterized it against like IWARP and Rocky, which maybe you could think of it as you know, similar. So, yeah. see these are very implementation specific um, you know, you'll see very implementation-specific results. Um, it sort of depends on you know how that TCP offload engine was built and what sort of interface it it provides. Because what you'd see, you know, and at least in my uh, experience, what I've seen is how you're able to create the interface and how you're able to connect it to the application is super, super important, and that really determines performance. Um, so. You might make some implementation choices that can swing it, you know, pretty wildly. But we didn't do any comparison with a particular tow engine because we, you know, this is the comparison we did. Yeah. You showed some latency improvements. That's great. Is that added latency? Ah, thank you for reminding because I I, I spaced out on making a very important point. Um, <clears throat> the ADQ in particular is really, really aimed at reducing tail latency um, because what we, what, and separate from what we showed here for NVMe or TCP, uh, you may have now seen some public announcements that are also being made on you know, other applications. Um, but the basic idea behind, behind ADQ, the, the key things that ADQ brings you is first and foremost is predictability and the predictability translates to improvements in tail latency. It's very important, especially when you scale out and especially when you're doing a lot of disaggregated um, you know, solutions, that tail latency actually is a determiner on how wide you can scale and what you can do. And, um, and with ADQ, uh, we have significantly reduced uh, tail latency. Yeah, this was the FIO average. Yeah, we, we also have the, ni the 99th, and I don't think we, we put it in here. Will ADQ work with other NICs? Um, so what we have done right now is, you know, we have, we have uh, opened this up, right? It is in the Linux kernel. The, the patches that we have done 
is out there. And so our, our goal is for this to be an open technology. Now, obviously, you know, Intel Nix um, combined with the, the, the things that we put out there in open source, it leverages that and it leverages that uh, in, a, in a differentiated way. But uh, the core uh, code that needs to be there in the kernel is already upstream and out there. So going to that question, right, you can see that there are like these five kernel things that we had done to enable it. Uh, the, the last two are the you know, ones from a configuration point of view. You use the standard Linux configuration tool called Traffic Control, TC. And TC has been enabled with how to configure essentially ADQs. How do you tell the NIC, you know, this is the signature of the application that you want to accelerate, and how many queues are you allocating for it, um, and what sort of bandwidth control, egress bandwidth control you want to apply. Um, those are, you know, that's how you do that. Okay, looks like there are no more questions. Thank you very much, and thanks for spending the time with us.